Inner Voice, a heartfelt chat with Dr. Fujian. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujian Zane and have Sean in studio. Now, this show is about what matters most in our life, our mind, our thoughts, our feelings, actions, relationships, and our fulfillment in this beautiful journey of life. So in this show, I'll bring you the latest research from Yale University on our genes determining our marital happiness. And then I will speak to Dr. Harville Hendricks and Dr. Helen Hunt, originators of the Imago Theory and Therapy, and they're the authors of New York best-selling books. Today, we're going to talk about their newly revised book, Getting the love you want. It's a guide for couples. So all you couples and romantic lovers, you've got to listen to this show. And you can also call us and even talk to uh, Dr. Hel Harville Hendricks and Dr. Helen Hunt and I. You can call us at the studio line 951-922-3532. We'll be right back with the tip of the week. Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujian Zain. You can get it now at fujian.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. So this is the tip of the week. Now, I've noticed last week when we're not committed to the state of peace and happiness inside of us, or we're not committed to being in peace and really experiencing our happiness when we're other, with others, we constantly create fights in our own head. And then obviously when we have the fights, when we have the fights outside, inside of ourselves, what do you think we do? We obviously fight with people who are outside of ourselves. So with others, we do fight because if we're upset, um, we're going to be we don't have any um, tolerance for people. And what happens is that we're going to react. And then in return, it's a feedback in the inner fight. If it's a feedback from them getting upset with us. And then it adds to the inner fighting dialogue with a sense of entitlement. So I have the right now to be angry. And this vicious cycle continues all day. Now, some of us, even when the other person goes away, we just kind of continue to fight in our head until we can prove to them and ourselves that we're right. The reason I mentioned uh, a commitment to peace and happiness is that no one really stays in kind of like peace and happiness and joy um, all day. We just don't. Our thoughts and emotions are always vacillating. There are many good reasons for us to be joyous and many good reasons for us to be feeling angry and sad all day. However, the commitment to be in peace and state of happiness allows us to reroute our attentions, thoughts, intentions toward ways of thinking and behaving so that we return to this state of peace and happiness instead of roaming around for hours and days in fear and sadness and anger. Now, you don't get to choose the automatic thoughts and emotions that arise constantly within you but you do have the choice of committing yourself to a state that comes back to peace and happiness and therefore shifting your thoughts and emotions and behaviors toward creating a sustaining peace and happiness. You certainly deserve it. You certainly deserve to be in peace and happiness. And I think if you tell yourself, and I've been practicing this, that's why I'm telling you, if you keep telling yourself, I deserve to be happy, and I just no longer today want to experience anger and sadness, then you get yourself into that. You can always get the message of what your anger and sadness and fear are telling you. Do something about it, and then 
say to yourself that I deserve to be in peace and happiness and um, shift your thoughts and moods to be that to experience peace and happiness. Um, we're going to be right back with research and that research we're going to talk about the genetic factors that you might have to create a happy marriage. Don't go anywhere. We'll be right back. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM.com. Welcome back to Inner Voice. And I'm Dr. Fushan Singh. So, Yale University researchers concluded that the happiest, most secure feelings couples in an experiment had at least one person in the pair with a variation in their genes receptors for oxytocin known as the love hormones. Joan Monin, associate professor at the Yale University, Yale School of Public Health, says this study shows that how we feel in our close relationships is influenced by more than just our shared experiences with our partners over time. In marriage, people are also influenced by their own and their partner's genetic predispositions. Almost 180 married couples participated in this study in Yale School and University, ranging from age 37 to 90. They filled out a survey on marital satisfaction and gave a saliva sample that was used to map their genes. Oxytocin is linked to bonding and has all kinds of feel-good nicknames like the cuddle hormone and it's actually a pain reliever too. Now, according to a new research in another university conducted at Binghamton University, State University of New York, a research team evaluated whether different genotypes, possible genetic combinations of the oxytocin receptor gene influenced how spouses supported one another, which is a key determinant of overall marital quality. So Yale was looking at marital happiness and um, New York State University was having was looking at marital the overall marital quality. So oxytocin receptor gene was targeted because it is related to the regulation and release of oxytocin, which is a hormone associated with feeling love and attachment. Oxytocin also appears to be relevant to social cognition and a wide range of social behavior. They are the first to provide evidence that variation on specific genes related to oxytocin functioning impact overall marital quality, in part because they're relevant to how partners provide and receive support from each other. The team's findings highlights that particular genes may impact marital quality by influencing important relational processes, but that context shapes when particular genotypes are more or less beneficial to the marriage. They found that variation at two particular locations on oxytocin receptor gene impacted the observed behaviors of both husbands and wives, and that differences in behavior across couples had small but cumulative effects on overall evaluation of support, and thus marital quality in general. However, what emerged as most relevant to overall marital quality for both partners was genotype, genotypic variation among husbands at a specific location. Husbands with a particular genotype, which other researchers associated with signs of social deficits, were less satisfied with the support that they were provided. 
So their receptors, they can't even, they when they were provided uh, support by their wife, they could not really take it in. Being less satisfied with the support they got from their wives was also associated with being less satisfied with their marriage. Genes matter when it comes to the quality of a marriage because genes are relevant to who we are as individuals and characteristics of the individual and can impact their marriage. Now, shelling out some cash on genetic profiles might be an easy expense, at least compared to the cost of divorce. So there are actually now um, agencies and companies who are looking at providing uh, the genetic uh, composition of people um, and psychological profiles. So they're doing this as a service for people who are looking for mates. There's something to be said also for the power of genetic makeup, but there are lots of ingredients in the recipe of a long-term romance, like personality mixes, how families mesh, and how couples choose to spend their free time. And of course, there's also the role of money in a relationship. A Merrill Lynch study looked into what people wanted most in partners. 56% of the participants said they would prefer a mate who could give them financial security compared to the 44% who said they were in search of someone who would just send them head over heels. Now, genes are only part of the equation and the extent of their influence is not yet known. Now, your predisposition of your genes does not predetermine what you do, but it might help people be more conscious of their inclinations. So that's the research we have about genetic compositions. And um, if it matters to you, uh, you could definitely go to these companies and check them out after all these research that are being for multiple universities in the United States. I am excited now to have our guest, Dr. Harville Hendricks and Dr. Helen Hunt, who are partners in life and work with me. They are the co-creators of Imago Relationship theory and therapy, which has spread globally through Imago Relationships International and now is renamed as Imago Relationship Worldwide, an organization that has trained over 2,500 therapists in over 53 countries, including me, I got trained. They are also co-creators with other relational therapists, scientists, and businesses, professionals of Relationship First. It's a nonprofit organization that contributes to the creation of a relational culture through the distribution of new insights from the relational sciences and through Safe Conversations, a citywide experiment in Dallas, Texas. They are, both of them, authors of three New York Times bestsellers, Getting the Love You Want, Keeping the Love You Find, and Giving the Love That Heals, Making Marriage Simple, and six other books. The Space Be Between was released in 2017, and their latest release is the revised and updated edition of Getting the Love You Want, A Couple's Guide. It is a fantastic, fantastic book. I gave it to every couple who came and saw me. It has amazing exercises in it, and I'm so glad that it was revised. Harvell Hendricks was a couples therapist with more than 40 years experience as an educator, clinical trainer, and a lecturer whose work has appeared on Oprah 17 times. In addition to Helen, Helen's Hunt partnership in the co-creation of Imago, she's a sole author of Faith and Feminism and, and the Spirit Moved Them. She was installed in the Women's Hall of Fame for her leadership in the global women's movement. They believe that how we interact with each other in all contexts, family, workplace, school, etc., is the key to our emotional, physical, and economic well-being and to the well-being of our children and society. Together, they're committed to the transformation of relationships and to the evolution of a relational culture. We'll be right back with Dr. Harville Hendricks and Dr. Helen Hunt.
Have you ever wished you could just wake up one day, reach across your nightstand, and hit the life reset button? Let's face it, the struggles and frustrations of everyday life leave millions of women and men around the globe yearning for a new way. And the new way is right here in Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want by Dr. Fujan Zain. You can get it now at fujan.com or amazon.com. Life Reset, the awareness integration path to create the life you want. You deserve it. Join the conversation every Monday afternoon at 3 p.m. Pacific for Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Dr. Fujian is a radio and TV host, international speaker, psychotherapist, life coach, and the author of Life Reset, The Awareness Path to Create the Life You Want. She brings you the latest research and interviews with experts in the field of cognitive sciences. Anyone who loves to grow and create growth for humanity gets a voice on this call-in show. Inner Voice Heartfelt Chat with Dr. Fujian. Monday afternoons at 3 p.m. PM Pacific on Smart Talk KMET 1490 AM and on KMET 1490 AM.com. Hello, I'm Dr. Fujian, and I have great news for you. I'm offering a special time limited offer to anyone who's interested in online therapy or coaching sessions. I've developed the awareness integration model, which allows in only 12 weeks to raise your self-esteem and confidence and let go of your thoughts and emotions that produce depression and anxiety for you. So call today to schedule your online session and save $600. Call me today at 818-648-2140. That's 818-648-2140. 2140 or go to www.fujan.com. Welcome back, everyone, to the Inner Voice Show. I'm Dr. Fujan Zane, and I am so excited to have Dr. Harvell Hendricks and Dr. Helen Hunt with me, the originators of Imaco Theory and Therapy. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks We're so delighted much. to be here. Yes, it is so exciting. I think this is our third or fourth interview together, and I'm always excited. And I was so, so excited to know that you guys have revised this book. I love this book, Getting the Love You Want. It's um, the guide for couples, and I have given it to every single couple that I have seen um, you know, in my practice because I think you guys have amazing exercises there. And it works. It really works. So everyone who's listening or viewing us, I'm telling you, this works. So please, please, please use it and listen really great because the two people who not only uh, created the theory, but also lived it and worked it through in their own marriage are here uh, to tell you about it all. So why do we fall in love? What is this whole hoopla about falling in love? And that we keep getting out of it in some relationships and we fight in relationships and then this yearning to be back in love, it keeps bringing us back. Well, uh, the, um, uh, the answers to that for Helen and me keep getting more complex. Mm -hmm. uh, 30 years ago, we started off and it was a simple thing that there's a memory connection in the brain with the uh, person who you meet who's similar to your caretakers and when that happens uh, your brain says um, a chance to redo childhood although it's not conscious um, what we what we are now um, saying is that the experience of romantic love the emotions um, has been called an illusion and temporary but we now really function with the idea that that uh, emotional experience is is a, is a part of our nature that's a joyful aliveness that we think describes <clears throat> what we are as a human being that we are not uh, just neutral uh, we are uh, our nature is joyfulness and aliveness and what happens in childhood is that you come into the world with that you feel joyfully alive if you and and it's sustained if you are um, with a caretaker who is um, resonant with you, who is attuned to you, and you keep that, but most caretakers are not. So they either, for whatever reason, 
break the early connection with the child. And what, what the child then loses is the sensation of full aliveness and joy. Yes. It's possible through the resonance. So, um, you, so the child goes through life and in adulthood in the search and find mission, uh, they do uh, find a, a person who, who is similar to the caretakers. Um, but what is attractive to them is not that they get nurturing needs met and things we used to think of as like being held again and so forth. What they get is the recovery of the original experience of full aliveness and joy. They anticipate that's going to happen again with this person because they're similar to the one with whom they lost it. So it's not an illusion that you get back and a passing fantasy of you know, emotional intensity. It is the retasting of the essence of life itself, which is yes. what makes it so uh, compelling because it is us recovering ourselves in romantic love. But of course, we lose it again in the power struggle. But it's, yes. it's that, and you can only have that in interacting with a significant person. It's not something you can create yourself. You can't meditate yourself into it, climb mountains, jump out of planes, trigger it in any way. It is a relational experience. Yes. It can happen in relationship. And Helen, um, I also wanted to ask, uh, what if uh, someone did not get that type of a love? Uh, you know, they didn't have the correct attachment as a, as a child. They didn't get that type of caring and nurturance that they were, uh, let's say, hoped to get. Um, when, in your theory, as we grow up and we want to connect to someone that resembles and get the joy, what if they didn't have that? And a lot of people don't have that. How do they, uh, how do they feel love? Uh, in a relationship? How could they create the same thing in the joy? Well, um, I think Harville would agree that practically nobody got the love they really wanted. <laughs> True. And I, even if our parents were present, mm -hmm. and even if they were in the same house a lot, or even if they were in the same room, if they were preoccupied, um, um, we say that almost everyone had either intrusive parents or neglectful parents. You can almost always uh, identify your parents. The most painful experience was one or the other. That growing up, they felt wounded or neglected. So everything Harville said um, in his answer applies really to everyone, that we seek out someone unconsciously that causes us to re-experience either being um, neglected or being uh, smothered. I'm sorry, they're either, yeah. Um, they're intrusive. Intrusive or neglected. And yeah. uh, so we seek that person out. But uh, one point I'd like to make about why do we fall in love, if I may add to Harville's answer, is really all of nature is dyadic. Mm -hmm. there's, uh, there's something... Um, in all of nature, uh, things are either hot or cold, or uh, things are wet or dry, or things are loud or soft. Um, there's an in, there's an out. There's an up, there's a down. Everything, there's, it's a, uh, nature is just dyadic. And, and for some reason, all of us long to be with one somebody else. Mm -hmm. The issue that people need to realize is that we're drawn to an opposite. And, and um, I love Harville's phrase that incompatibility is the grounds for marriage. You're going to seek out someone who's an opposite from you. So to have the joy that you're talking about, the joy, the love, to get the joy and love, you have to learn to handle incompatibility and difference. And... Um I know that uh, when someone is going after the romantic love itself, uh, there is uh, there is that essence of wanting to join. And then obviously, as you said, also to Dr. Hendricks, that there's a, uh, you go in after a while and then the power struggle shows up. And in the power struggle, what we experience again is um, maybe our own childhood woundings, maybe our own pattern, maybe the way that we see things. Um, I remember talking to uh, my mate a couple of days ago, and I said, it's interesting that I felt betrayed by my family, my mother, my father, and that type of love gotten 
kind of uh, connected to also betrayal. So it's like, regardless of how much um, this relationship that we have is so beautiful, somewhere behind here, it's always waiting for that betrayal to happen or is like looking for signs. And then if I'm not really conscious, I could really, really fall into it. And it creates those power struggle. So there's definitely... As, as concept of a subconscious world that keeps coming and then you also are teaching in your path watch for that but also look at a conscious partnership can you talk about that a bit about a conscious partnership yes yeah um well a conscious partnership is basically that you become aware of what your unconscious has been trying to do mm -hmm. and that it's uh, so so you're no longer operating uh, with um, with reactivity. You're operating with with intentionality, and in a conscious uh, relationship, both people know consciously that each of them was wounded in childhood, and that uh, you know in a conscious relationship, you're aware that most of your partner's behavior uh, that doesn't make sense to you and. Uh, causes you a lot of distress, uh, curiosity, or whatever, uh, is a function of um, their interaction with their caretakers in childhood. The unmet need is presenting itself, but your partner most of the time doesn't know that their negative behavior is an attempt to get a need met, which can't be met with negative behavior. But if you're in a conscious relationship, you know that when you feel like you want to criticize your partner, for not doing something like showing up on time or hugging you or sending your birthday card or doing anything that would be nurturing and caring, uh, you know that that push to get them to do something is coming from your past so that you then back off from making the partner the problem mm -hmm. and engaging with the partner in the need that you are trying to get met uh, so that it can be collaboratively Met rather than um, judgmentally met. We go, we go, to, we go after our partners with criticism, hoping they will love us, and not knowing that the criticism makes them uh, back off from us and uh, and repeats for them the trauma of their childhood. Yes. So consciousness means when I'm acting, uh, having funny feelings or acting crazy or getting reactive, the past is showing up in my behavior right now, and I need to do something. Helen is so elegant in our workshops to say, I need to get in touch with what is it that I want when I'm feeling frustrated and then get clear what that is and, and clear enough that I can ask for it with enough clarity that my partner can say, oh, I get it. So you're wanting me to call you twice a day from work instead of telling me I never pay attention to you. Mm -hmm. uh, you want to call so that it becomes specific. So you begin to move from reactivity into intentionality, from frustration to requesting. And therefore, you your relationship becomes a collaboration rather than a power struggle between opponents. It becomes a collaboration between partners. I would think, would you add to that? No, I think that's great. You think that's okay, uh, that you. Your collaboration. <laughs> Yeah, there is. Um, I know that I've heard from you that there was a time in um, in your marriage that you were going through some ups and downs and you were really working uh, the imago therapy within your system and your marriage. And uh, and within that, you came up with um, zero negativity state, like commitment to zero negativity. And um uh, again, I've seen that in my own partnerships and I've seen it with a lot of my clients, like just you said, they come in with a lot of the state of negativity and the way that they uh, portray or even see their partners in their own head, in their own being, it becomes a monster. And then you want to love this monster that you created in your own head. And then you're going to share with that person what type of a monster I think you are, but then I request to have love. So this is something that automatically people do a lot. And I know that you have gone to the space of zero negativity. Can you say more about that? And how would you ask people to put themselves into the space of zero negativity? Because sometimes it's pretty hard to get yourself out of negativity. Well, uh, Helen is throwing that to me. So 
Um, well, it's because you really, I, I, I was so impressed by, with how you love that idea. Well, and I was thinking about the fact that you uh, are uh, primarily the genesis of that idea um, with regard to when we first sort of discovered our own uh, rampant negativity. And <laughs> I didn't think I was being neg <laughs> negative. I thought I was being helpful. I, I, know, I was just trying to improve Marble, but he said it was negative. I was shocked. Yeah, and, 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 you, and you did improve me. Look, look at look at look at what I what I what I become. Um, but we were we were in the uh, nadir of our relationship, and the uh, and we were uh, talking about divorce, and but I. We hadn't separated, and we gave ourselves um, about a nine-month period to um, see what we could do. And so we did a, had a date on Thursdays. And one Thursday, one of our favorite dates was to go to bookstores. And one uh, Thursday, we went to a bookstore. And that's because Harville loved to go and find getting the love you want and see if it was out <laughs> or in. <laughs> And if it was face oh, out, he was that's in a true. good mood for the night. Yeah, and we, if it was in, he'd go. Uh, well, he'd turn it out, and then yeah, he'd get I, a good mood, too. And, yeah. and, and then go. <laughs> but we went to this uh, to the uh, astrological section of the bookstore this time and instead of to the uh, relationship section and found a book on astrological relationships. <laughs> and what was fascinating about this book is it was about 400 pages. It's a huge tome. But it was full of essays about how different people with different signs yes. with each other. Yeah. And so we found Helen is in February. I'm in September. So we found the September, February signs. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but I know that, that our month. And basically, this essay said, uh, to us that we, what, did, what is the phrase you that remember? You will soon decimate your relationship entirely if you don't give up your negative scrutiny of each yeah. other. <laughs> so so we said, oh. Who, um, who's been watching? Then we <laughs> thumbed through all of the uh, <laughs> half a dozen of the other couples, uh, the astrological couples, and that information was not in any, we thought it was, you know, in every one. Obviously, yeah, every, real every negative. Would do that. that all all would be <laughs> negative. The others would say you should take vacations more often. Yeah. Well, I would love to have gotten that one, but <laughs> but we we got that one. So it hit us. It was like one of those. And there's a book called Godwinks that that's been out. This is like a Godwink. We took it seriously and went back home and started mm -hmm. examining our relationship. And Helen came up with the idea that we. Um, that we begin to monitor our negative interactions with each other. And she proposed that we get a calendar. I'm, I'm going to tell your story if you, you well, want to yeah, tell that. No, I, I'm happy if you That we it. get a calendar. Uh, and so we went to the drugstore and got one, and we got a red pen, which we used with a check mark for the days we were not negative, and a black pen and an X for the days we were. And uh, it was probably three months of mainly totally X's, black X's, because one or the other of us would would do a put down. That, that's what we call it. Negativity is a, is a put down. Would do a put down. It took, and in the fourth and fifth and sixth and seventh month, we began to get more and more check marks because we were regulating our reactivity and our negative exchanges. And, and that is, in fact, is what led us after about nine months to be at a point where we said we actually can stay together. Uh, because we are now feeling yeah. safe with each other, can more connected to each other. And after that nine months, I think about three months after that, we had a recommitment ceremony on the uh, two, uh, and, uh, New Year's Eve 2000, uh, this recommitment. So we took that as a personal uh, exercise for us. And I got to thinking about it as a clinician. Uh, and <laughs> that is a, Every couple I work with has this problem Helen and I have right. in one degree or the other. So we began to put together the zero negativity as a theory and that we integrated it into, into the practice. Um, and the way we did it was, um, was pretty much straightforward. And that was to 
uh, asked people if they would um, consider a zero negativity pledge and do it at the beginning of therapy. Mm. And put it into our workshops and at, the, at our workshops the first evening, Friday evenings of these two day workshops, uh, we ask everybody to look at and read a zero negativity pledge and sign it for the rest of the workshop. Mm. And therapy, if they would uh, sign this, um, and I found I had to do it session by session, but after a while, could they sign it until therapy was over? So we made it uh, a a uh, a part of the therapeutic thing because safety, it began to be logical. Safety is non-negotiable for a thriving relationship. Yes. Negativity creates danger, anxiety and danger. So you can't be negative and have a great relationship. You can't negate and love at the same time. So you have to make a choice. And if you think you're loving and you're negative, you're not loving because the brain cannot receive both of those signals. Yes. And the negative signal is the one the brain will assume is the real one. And the loving signal, uh, it will assume is, is not it. And we think that goes back to childhood as well, where uh, all of us come into the world trailing clouds of glory. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and it feels great. And then the caretakers rupture their relationship with us in some way. So feeling good with somebody creates the possibility that I could feel bad with this person. Mm -hmm. So what has to happen with great relationships is that zero negativity has to become reliable and predictable. And if I know that anytime you're frustrated with me, you're going to come with a request instead of a criticism, then mm -hmm. I can relax what Stephen Porges calls the uh, dorsal uh, vagal, the, the dorsal vagal thing, which breeds uh, negativity or the uh, fight flight response and flee flight fight and are shut down and and feel okay with you but i can't feel okay with you unless i can predict that when i'm with you you will um ask for what you want rather than being critical and judgmental so it became now a real fixture mm -hmm. in our shops and in therapy and we now teach it as a part of the curriculum or imago therapists across the world. I also have experienced um, couples who uh, find themselves, and a lot of couples, who find themselves into a role of uh, like a, a parent-child relationship with each other or uh, a different kind of a power that holds that one of them assumes that I know better than you. And um, although they won't say it, even if they got very conscious and they've learned all how to do it, but the context of it is more still the request, even if they're not coming from a criticism, but the request are constantly moving as if that I'm requesting for you to change something. Um, and then the kind of the, the shift becomes um, in a way that the, the, the parent consistently uh, the parent mode, the mate who is acting like a parent and they don't even know it because there's a lot of times they say, I'm just doing it out of love. I just, you know, this is what works for our life and it's got to be that way. Uh, but the one who is being requested consistently to ship, they become almost like a, you know, a rebellious uh, teenager after a while because they do sense that obviously there's some negativity hidden under those requests uh, and they're not accepting me as who I am. And I know that part of this book, you also have a chapter about discovering your partner and creating a zone of affirmation for them. Um, can you kind of uh, tell us a little bit about this dynamic and how to accept your partner as who they are versus consistently uh, trying to change them? Yeah. Well, one thing uh, that we recommend to couples is to alternate days where one is on duty to make sure the relationship goes well that day. And the next day, the other's on duty. So there's a shared sense of making requests or making sure there's enough positive that both go to bed feeling connected. And so on the odd days of the month, a couple, you know, one person say, okay, I'll take the odd days. And the other goes, well, I'll take the even days. And you can have a calendar to make sure that 
on your appointed day, you make sure you go to bed connected. And that doesn't mean that um, you can't bring up requests in the day or whatever, but it really becomes a more shared, it, it, um, uh, it makes it both people are taking care of the relationship. So that's one way. That's that's one way to respond to that question. Do you have other ways? Well, the um, <clears throat> the uh, mental state of assuming that I know best <clears throat> uh, is what we call symbiosis, and that and that's I um, think that that um, that you should think and feel and behave as I do. Um, that's a symbiotic, what we call a symbiotic thing, meaning you have not yet, quote, seen your partner except through the eyes of your own perceptions and experience. So if you're frustrated with your partner, you know that that uh, when you become conscious, you know that if you're frustrated with your partner, you are, they, most of the time your partner is simply being who they are. They're not necessarily trying to make things bad for you. They're just, Helen's just being Helen. She's a multitasker. So if I get upset with that, that's not Helen's problem. It's my problem that I'm upset with her because I don't see she can do, I can only do one thing at a time and that poorly. She can do two or three things at a time and that well. Um, and for me to accept that rather than be judgmental about it, is to break uh, my symbiosis and to do what we call differentiate. <clears throat> I have to distinguish myself, my partner from myself. And when I do that and realize they are themselves and they are not the fantasy I have of them, uh, and I begin to relax that fantasy, uh, they then emerge as a <clears throat> person who is delineated as a real person rather than the person I wish they were. So that differentiation process, and I think the way couples uh, do in addition to doing alternating days, that, that what we, as you know, we put couples in what we call an imago dialogue process yes. all the time. And we don't do anything else except them help them talk to each other so that ultimately in that uh, dialogue process where one listens the other mirrors and then they go back and forth. The defenses uh, begin to relax and that anger that's underneath the wish can be languaged as when I was little and this happened to me, I felt uh, devalued, abandoned, alone. And this, if I can say that with the vulnerability that comes with that sort of declaration, then my partner moves is moved to empathy rather than to judgment. And when, uh, and if that can be mutual, then both people have now becoming, are becoming differentiated and are able then to see their partner as a real person toward whom they can have empathy. Empathy meaning I can feel and imagine what it must be like to be you. And I can imagine that when you're feeling lonely and abandoned, that it really is painful for you. Is, is that is that how it really feels? Mm -hmm. And so if you engage in that sort of process, all of those um, uh, hidden resentments or held resentments while you're being nice to ask for something begin to show up as your own anxiety, your own uh, hurt, um, and that, that when you move to empathy, that's where the transition occurs toward collaboration. Once we move to mutual empathy, then we say, you know what? We both have needs and we're beating each other up, trying to get each other to meet those needs. But what if we talk about this as partners in the project of connecting and co-creating our relationship instead of opponents who are opposing each other and doing power plays? Yes. And that takes a while to learn the dialogue process and to move from a judgment to collaboration and then to co-creating because you have to actually co-create new behavioral patterns, but you create them together. There's no book you can go pull them down and say, here are the 25 best things for healthy couples. You create the patterns that work to keep you safe with each other 
uh, on all occasions and vulnerable to each other's needs at all occasions so that if I'm empathic and vulnerable, I'm more than likely to stretch into something uncomfortable for me. But if I'm not empathic, but feeling hurt or judgmental or judged, I more than likely may do something that would be, quote, nice, but it won't be real. And you'll know it's not real, and therefore it's not satisfying, and therefore nothing gets solved. So you really have to go into what you so we talked earlier about conscious partnership, so that you're dialogical all the time, moving toward collaboration and then co-creation, and then carry those things out. And those couples then have a pattern that becomes a permanent process for them. So they don't have to show up in therapist office anymore because they are now regulating their own relationship. And you also spoke about creating a sacred space and the space between. And this is the quality of what you're talking about, creating that type of a um, sacred space, which is between. Can you talk a little bit about that, how to set up that space? Yeah, well, Helen, Helen came up with that idea, so she's the one to I'll take first, that one on. Um, I'll first mention how we began to think about that idea. It was in our early years of marriage. And um, I had read a, a book by a Jewish mystic, Martin Buber, and it's on the I-Thou relationship. Have you ever heard of that book? No. It's, um, it's called I-Thou Relationship? Yeah. I'll go get it. That most people treat uh, their partner like an I-It. Mm -hmm. The person they live with is an It to satisfy their needs because mm -hmm. their partner should love them, right? And so it's an I-it relationship. And Martin Buber, he's a theologian, and he said, you know, you never get to love when you're treating someone with expectations. You ought to do this. You ought to do that. You're an it, and I'm the thou. <laughs> or I'm the I. I am the thou. And he said, when you, the way to get to love is if you treat someone like I-thou instead of I-it. And that's when you actually imagine every day becoming, looking for ways that you can become a servant to your partner. You, you love them equal, if not greater than yourself mm -hmm. around certain transactions. So the relationship becomes their happiness as well as your happiness. Yes. And you have to practice getting to eye thou. And Boover says, that when two people achieve the shift from the I it to the I thou, the energies of universal love become, changes. becomes, it moves into the space between the two people. Mm -hmm. And there's an energy field of love between the two people. So I was sharing that with Harville because he said what was important is not the I or the thou, it's the between. Yeah. If that's where the sacred can take residence if two people learn to treat each other mm -hmm. in a sacred way. And so Harville loved that idea and began to talk about the safe between, the space between uh, in Imago therapy, that in, between two couples is an energy field. And that energy field can either be safe where two people are respectful or it beca can become toxic by a voice tone or a look in the eye or words. And suddenly the relationship is unsafe for your partner because of the way you've looked at them. Right. And maybe you didn't even realize it. And so this is why zero negativity is so important because with zero negativity, we have a little uh, quick repair. If one of you is being negative, you just do a little ouch, or we call it, or I, we sometimes use a little flag word like marshmallow or something, <laughs> ice cream. And that means well, one of us has done something negative and let's have a repair. We have a redo or an apology or yeah. say it differently yeah. so that they achieve safety. So, so we're, yeah, we're bring bring back the sacredness and the safety within the system. Go ahead, Harville. Well, the, um, the thing I wanted to you know, add to what Helen's saying is that this has become now our uh, animago, our core organizing construct. Um, and it replaces 
a hundred and fifty years of focus on the, uh, going inside mm -hmm. and uh, and looking at your memories, dreams, and nightmares, and all of that, and trying to rearrange the furniture of <coughs> the inner world. <coughs> uh, what, what we discovered in working with couples is that we don't get very far helping them do sort of parallel psychotherapy. What we get really far is when we focus on how they interact with each other. Yes. So that space between is the location of interactions that create memories that are then recorded in the memory system of the brain, in the hippocampus and in the amygdala. And those memories then become the uh, context through which we look at our partner. If those memories are negative in the space between, then you have the anticipation of being hurt. Yes. If they're positive and all the interactions are positive, which means you really are true with zero negativity, then the brain begins to anticipate that when I see my partner, it, it will be safe, it will be fun, something good will happen, we'll laugh and play. Yeah. But if, that, if the memory system uh, is not predictably, is not full of memories of positive interaction, uh, then the relationship will always be what we call a defensive yes. relationship. It creates um, unsafety and anxiety. We only have one more minute. So if it's the last conversation that you want our uh, audience and listeners to know about the uh, your book that's coming out, please let them know and let them know where they can get it. Well, the uh, place to go is harvillandhelen.com for our website. There they can see all the things that we do, the workshops we do. Mm -hmm. And I think the best place to go now to um, uh, to get the book is Amazon because mm -hmm. I have a good discount on it. And Barnes and Noble is also a major distributor, but it's in bookstores all across the country. It's the 30th anniversary of yeah. Getting Love You Want. We revised it and updated and made it uh, up to date where we're like the comments that we're talking about today. We've now yeah. entered into the book. I'm so glad that um, I'm, I have you again on the show. I always learn from you. Um, your work in Mango Therapy was the first work that I've ever, be, when I became a therapist, I used it for myself in my own sense and uh, worked with my clients. I've you know been to your workshop and um, have learned in Mango. And every day, every time that I talk to both of you, I still learn a lot. So thank you. Thank you for everything that you have done for the field of therapy and for the field of relationship. For all of you who are with us, thank you for being with us. Create an amazing life for yourself and everyone around you and see you next week. Bye-bye.